Lord Jesus, in heaven, we glorify your name. Everybody, we bow down. We bow down before our Savior, who all in heaven, we glorify. In heaven, we glorify your name. We bow down. We bow down before thee. Your name is Alpha. You are Omega. You are ageless. You are ageless. You are changeless. You are Almighty, Almighty, victorious, everybody, lift your hands, glorious God, glorious we bow God. before say, holy your name is, lift your hands and worship him tonight, oh man. Worship at your feet. We bow before your throne. You are the glorious God. Lord, we bow before your throne. We worship at your feet. Bow before. Omega, you are ageless, you are changeless, almighty, victorious, glorious God, we bow before Jesus, my Lord. I thee adore. Oh, make me love thee more and more. Everybody sing, Jesus, my I thee adore. Oh, make me love. Jesus, my Lord. Jesus, I adore, I adore, I adore, I 
Jesus, my Lord, and Jesus, my Lord, and Jesus, my Lord, and Jesus, Jesus, my Lord, I Jesus, my Lord, Jesus, my Lord, I Lift your hands, lift your voice. We glorify. 
We glorify your holy name. Come on. I know his name. I know his name. His name is Jesus Christ. I know his name. Everybody say, I know his name. I know his name. His name is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus Christ. I know his name. For Jesus, you're the lily of the valley. Jesus, you are the bright and morning star. Hey. Oh, Jesus, you are the mighty man in battle, oh God. Hey. I call you Jesus, the master of the whatever body. Oh, St. Jesus, oh, Jesus, say you are the my sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, you're the bright and morning star. Oh Jesus, oh, oh Jesus, hey. you're, you're the, the mighty man in battle. I call you Jesus. I call you Jesus, the master of the world. Sing hallelujah. hallelujah. Master of the world, everybody, 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 sing Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. You alone is ever worship, Halle. You are the master of the world. The One more time, everybody. Sing, sing, hallelujah. Yeah,
name about Yahweh. Yahweh. Bow down and worship Yahweh tonight. We bow down and worship Yahweh. And worship Yahweh. Yahweh. We bow down and worship Yahweh. We bow down and worship Yahweh. We bow down. We bow down and worship Yahweh. And worship Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. You alone, Yahweh. We bow down and worship Yahweh. We bow down and worship you, Yahweh. Yahweh. One more time. We bow down, we bow down, we bow down and worship Yahweh. We bow down and worship you alone, Yahweh. Lamb of God, you the cedar have the right and of the Father, you are holy. Holy, you are holy. <laughs> holy, you are you are Lamb of God, you the cedar have the right and of the Father, you are holy. Kabada basiata, holy you are holy. your name in Jesus precious name amen and amen hallelujah somebody appreciate Jesus this evening amen hallelujah can we do something better for Jesus for the king of kings 
Amen. Hallelujah. Taking us first session this evening, let's welcome our own Pastor Olumide. Taking us on authentic manhood. Can we appreciate Jesus? Somebody shout a big hallelujah. Let's lift our hands. Let's just give him praise. Father, tonight we honor you. We give you praise and glory. You are our father. We are your sons. And we honor you tonight. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your work in our lives. We give you all the praise. Thank you for your servant, our Father in the Lord. Thank you for Jesus, the man of all men. Somebody just give him praise for me tonight. Somebody just give him praise tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the life you gave. Thank you for the blood you shed. We stand in your presence. And we ask that tonight you will make us more of a man in the name of jesus i pray for all my brothers standing in this place tonight that you will speak to the depth of their souls oh god that you will touch them deep in their masculinity that every brokenness there every wound there you will bring healing to it in the name of jesus we give you all the praise we give you all the glory in jesus name we pray hallelujah before you sit down find five men and give them a manly high five let them feel your masculinity. Stop high-fiving like women. Give someone a manly high-five. Let someone feel like you are a man. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Tonight I will be sharing a message... I first heard Pastor preach several years ago in Port Harcourt. He had been speaking on authentic manhood for a couple of weeks or a couple of days in Lagos, but I was, not, I was not in those meetings. And then we had this first encounter retreat we had in Port Harcourt. And I remember sitting on the third row of the minister's session as he shared this message. And for half of the period of the message, I was just weeping. Because I realized at that point I had been at least about 12 years in the journey of healing that God has been taking me through. But that day, a new dimension of the healing work of God in my spirit was opened up. But I wasn't just crying because I was finding healing. I was also crying because I knew that, that this was a message that God would have me preach and teach. And so I stand here today and I can say very boldly and clearly that I will not be here if not for pastor's ministry. Can we give God a hand? I will, not be, I will not be saying this, I won't be teaching this, if not for his ministry, his fathering, his pastoring, and his special love for me. How many of you know pastor loves me especially? Oh, okay, only a few of you know, that's a revelation. <laughs> and I really want to thank God and just appreciate God's servant, our Father in law. Can we just appreciate God for him? I'm not, it's not just protocol. I need someone to help me appreciate God for the gift of a father, for the gift of a pastor, for the gift of a teacher, a prophet, an apostle. It's not just protocol. I say it's not just protocol, it's a reality. And we give God all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I read two scriptures. First John chapter 2 verse 14. The subject is authentic masculinity. First John chapter 2 verse 14. I've written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong. On the line in your Bible, ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Watch ye, 
Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. In other words, behave like men. Be strong. Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. The essence of masculinity is strength. A man is nothing if he is not strong. The scriptures say it. Culture affirms it. That the essence of masculinity is strength. A man is nothing if he is not strong. When God made man in his own image, male and female created in them, the Bible says, he did not make generic people. He didn't just make people. He made the male and he made the female. And he put certain attributes of himself and packed it in the male man and made him different from the female man. And he put certain attributes of himself and packed it in the female man and made her different from the male man. And that part of himself that he packed in the male is the fact that God is a strong God. Every time God appears to a man in the Bible, he speaks to them, be strong, do not be afraid. Do be strong, do not be afraid. Strength is the essence of masculinity. We see it in scripture, we see it in culture. When a woman behaves strongly, when she shows courage, when she shows fortitude, someone will look at her and say, that's a woman like a man. That's a manly woman. Why not? Because women are, are not supposed to be strong or women cannot be strong, but because strength is the description of masculinity. This is a men's conference. Can I speak openly? Who is a man who cannot have an erection? What's a man who cannot have an erection? But the erection of the male genital is only a metaphor for who he is supposed to be in his soul. The unfortunate thing today is that there are men who can maintain a physical erection, but who have flaccid spirits, limp hearts, flaccid souls. Today, God is going to bring strength into your heart. I can hear an amen. I want to hear your amen like thunder. I say God is going to bring strength into your soul. Yeah. The essence of a man is strength. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. I've read it unto you, young men, because ye are strong. Strength is what defines masculinity. A man is supposed to be strong in character. So the first area of strength a man is supposed to develop is strength of moral character. Integrity. A man is not better than his word. If your word is weak, then you are a weak man. If your word is not dependable, then you are not a dependable man. Strength of character. A man is supposed to be strength spiritually. Strong in the knowledge of the word of God. Strong in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. A lot of times when women come to my counseling room and then they have problems in their marriage, one of the big challenges we have are the issues of men who cannot pray. Men who have to be bribed before going to church. A man is supposed to lead his family spiritually. He's supposed to know God. He's supposed to be able to cast out devils from his children and bring healing to their lives. Strength spiritually. A man is supposed to be strong emotionally. Fortitude of spirit perseverance, determination. These are all manly qualities. A man is supposed to display strength in leadership, the capacity to take initiative, the capacity to follow through, the capacity to inspire others. A man is supposed to have mental and financial strength. But the strength that God gave us as men and the fact that he made us men to be strong, he did it for a purpose. Stay with me, somebody, I'm going somewhere. Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 12. 
David had just been made king. And God had established his kingdom. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel. And that he had exalted his kingdom. Well, watch what he says next. For his people, Israel's sake. For his people, Israel's sake, God gives men strength, whether it is financial strength, whether it is physical strength, whether it's spiritual strength. God gives us strength to serve, to serve him, to serve our wives, to serve our children. But here's the tragedy in the world today. On one side, we have weak, passive men who have no strength. Children are suffering. Wife is suffering. Wife is going around begging for money to feed children. Just two days ago, a woman called me. Said, I've been married for 12 years. For 12 years, I have paid the rent. For 12 years, I have paid school fees. For 12 years, I have carried every financial load. My husband does not work. So finally, I said to him, let me give you, get you a visa. Go to America. Do some jobs. Earn some dollars. So the visa has been waiting for four months for him to travel. He has refused to go. And I said to her, why will he go and have to hustle and fight when he has a woman in the house that is feeding him? Everywhere you see passive men, weak men, men who defer to women, men who abdicate their position of leadership. Men who have been feminized. I was in a church one day. I'd gone to preach one of Dominion City churches. And it was on a Sunday morning. And a couple had just wedded on a Saturday. It was their Thanksgiving. And after the service, the pastor called them forward. You could see the woman. She was in front. She was dancing. She was all over the place. A guy was just coming like this. And then after the pastor had introduced them, welcomed the latest couple in town. And the man was standing next to him. And she said, do you want to say something? And he moved the mic towards him. And the guy was just looking. And the wife jumped in front of him and collected the mic. And said, praise the Lord. I knew immediately that something was wrong in that union. And by the time she shared the testimony, she was the one that married him. She told the story. Weak men, passive men, broken men, men lacking in moral strength, men lacking in spiritual authority, men lacking in spiritual strength. One woman came to me one time. Their marriage was two years separated. They were in court. They were about to divorce. And somewhere, someone, somehow they found me and then they came. And I said to the woman, and the, the man said, I left the home. I, I want to quit this marriage because she won't give me peace. She keeps going from place to place looking for prophets and bringing things home. I think she wants to kill me. So I asked the man, I asked the woman, why are you going from place to place? Why do you want to kill your husband? He said, Pastor, let me tell you the story. See, so one day in the middle of the night, my son woke up screaming. He had a nightmare. And I've been telling my husband that people want to kill this boy. So I carried him and tried to wake him up. Asked him to pray. And then he couldn't pray. He was just sleeping. He said, I should leave him alone. And the woman asked me, should I wait until they kill my son? I said, no, you're not supposed to wait until they kill your son. And there are thousands and millions of women who are in pain and in sorrow. Who have become praise to charlatans. Because they are married to men who are weak and passive. Thousands of daughters who are selling their bodies to be able to feed themselves, to be able to pay school fees. Because they are married to they are, they were, they, they have fathers who are weak and passive. When they God looked into Israel and he said, I seek a man. This was a congregation of about three million men. I seek a man. He said, I can find none. In a place where there were three million 
masculine people. But God could not find a man. Because being a man has nothing to do with having a male genital. But I have good news for you today. Anything weak and passive in your heart, tonight it will be strengthened. Amen. I said tonight it will be strengthened. Amen. I said everything weak and passive in your life tonight, it will be strengthened. Amen. So on one side, we have men who are passive. Men who have no strength. On the other side, we have men who are aggressive and domineering. Men who misuse their strength. He has money. But instead of using that money for service, knowing that he has been given strength to serve, knowing like David, that God has established his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel, he consumes it on himself. He would rather buy clothes for himself than clothe his family. Men who have strength, but who use the strength to oppress people, to oppress their wife, to oppress their children. They consume the strength on themselves. And all over the world, you find children in pain. You have women in pain. You have societies in pain because of men who either have no strength or men who misuse their strength. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he has exalted his kingdom for his people, Israel's sake. Tonight and for the rest of this program, God is going to bring an anointing to raise strong men upon this house in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody say to somebody say to your neighbor for me, you are one of those he's talking about. God is going to establish you in strength. Preach for me, somebody. God is going to establish you in strength. He's going to establish you in spiritual strength. He's going to establish you in financial strength. In the name of Jesus. But then the question is, why are men like that? What creates passive men? What creates bad men? Aggressive and dominant men who misuse their strength. There are three things. Number one is the sin nature. We all know that. The sin nature. Except as we constantly come before the cross and appropriate our deliverance from sin, all of us are vulnerable to either being weak and passive or being domineering and aggressive and dangerous. And then there is ignorance. A lot of men don't even know what it is to be a man. Listen to me, brothers. Men are not, men don't, a boy does not become a man automatically. Men are formed. Men are forged. Men are developed. And it is fathers that do it. Which brings me to the third reason why many of us are struggling with our masculinity. Because we are broken. But today God is going to fix us. I say God is going to fix us in the name of Jesus. Now there are five stages of a man's development. Watch me, I'm going somewhere. The first two stages are formative. The other three stages are expressive. It is what is formed in the man in the first two stages that he expresses in the next three stages. The first stage is the boyhood stage. From age 0 to 12, he's a young boy suckling under his mother. Around the age of 9 and 12, however, the father has to come in and intervene in that close relationship between the boy and his mother. And call that boy to himself. For all of us who have sons, you need to listen to me carefully here. Because if you have a boy that is 9, 10, he's in that stage of his life where you need to go and cut the emotional umbilical cord between him and his mother. When women give birth to children, at birth the umbilical cord, the physical one is cut. But they want to keep that emotional cord for the rest of the boy's life. So you have men who are 40, who are 45, who are still controlled by their mothers. Feminized men who have to ask their mother before they can take any decision. Around the age of 11, 12, the father is supposed to go in there, intervene, call that boy to himself. Begin to establish a strong relationship with, with him. He no longer goes to his mother for advice. 
He no longer goes to his mother to have his needs met. He comes to daddy. And then from the age of 12 to about 18, a boy is in his teenage years. Those two stages are formative. And whatever happens in those two stages is what he takes into his adult life. And he either becomes a passive man or he becomes a dangerous man. A man is built. A man is developed. A man is crafted by his father. And this is where many of us struggle. This is where the wounding and the brokenness has happened in our lives. Because in those two stages, when we were supposed to have certain things built into our soul, we didn't have it. Come with me to Matthew chapter, chapter 17. Let me quickly find that scripture. Matthew Jesus was being baptized. He comes out of the water. It was time for him to get into his full maturity. He was 30 years old. He was going to be launched into the third stage. That third stage is the stage of the warrior. When he's going to have to contend for his field and his purpose in life. And establish himself. And prepare himself for the next stage of his life. Which is the stage of kingship. Where a man already has taken his place. He's ruling over his world. He's expanding his frontiers. And he's raising other boys and other sons, sons, either physically or spiritually. Jesus was about to enter into that full maturity of masculinity. And the Bible said that as he came out of that water, the heavens opened. And a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The first statement God makes, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, is what every son needs, is the greatest gift every boy needs. To know that you are beloved by your father. To know that you are the apple of his eyes. To know that you are cherished by him. To know that he celebrates you. Without that gift, that deep knowledge inside the heart of a boy, that I am not the strongest person in my world. I have a father who loves me, who cherishes me, who makes life work for me. We become incapacitated as men as we grow up. To know you are loved by him, to know you are cherished by him, to know that you are affirmed by him, to know that he will move the mountains to get to you is the first gift we need from our fathers informing us into masculinity. And the unfortunate thing is that many of us did not have it. Many of you have heard my story. I'm not going to go into all those stories. But I grew up not knowing that my father loved me. I remember the first time he ever hugged me. We were in church. Because until that time, and I was already about 24 years old, we were in church together, and we were standing beside each other when this American preacher comes to town, and he said, hug your neighbor. And that was the first time I felt my father's body on my own. Masculinity is passed from a man to another. You can't be a man by yourself. Self-made man is a fallacy. There's no man who is self-made. It is the love of the father, the affection, the joy it shows when he sees you, that builds you strength on the inside, emotional security. Who you have come to be today, your identity was given to you by the interactions you had with your father. If he treated you as a nobody, you grew up believing that you are a nobody. If he treated you as if you are a prized human being, you grew up believing that you are a significant someone. Because identity is everything. Listen to me, brothers. Identity is everything. Identity is everything. All that we have, all that we do, and all that we experience come out of who we believe we are. Come, my brother. Yes. Just one of you come. 
Watch this. I'm going to insult this guy. I'm going to really insult him. And I want you to see his reaction. You know, you are a very... Look at the green cap you're wearing. Something must be wrong with you. Huh? You're wearing a very ugly, terrible green cap. Where did you buy this kind of cheap, crap, crappy cap? Where did you buy it from? Were you blind when you buy this? When you when you saw when you saw this kind of green cap and you wore it on your head? Are you okay at all? The guy is laughing at me. Why? He's not wearing a green cap. And I can stand here from now till tomorrow and insult him. After a while, he will start feeling sorry for me. Because he's going to realize that something must be wrong with me. Why? Because he's not wearing a green cap. When you know who you are, nothing can touch you. Once, once you know who you are, no devil can touch you. No criticism can touch you. No rejection can touch you. Men flounder and fumble in life because we don't know who we are. When a man beats his wife because he feels insulted by her, it's not because she insulted you. It's because you don't know who you are. Insult cannot touch a secure man. Insult cannot touch a secure man. Poverty cannot touch a secure man. How we respond in life as men is not a function of what is going on around us. It's a function of what we are on the inside. You have a car? You have a car. Does it sometimes break down? It sometimes breaks down. You have a mechanic. What's your mechanic's name? Or SAS is your mechanic. When your car breaks down, do you sometimes feel frustrated? That what, what's wrong with this car? But every time you take your car to Osas garage, have you ever heard him complain? Have you ever seen him frustrated and say, oh God, why are you always bringing this guy here? He has never complained. What is the difference between you and him? He sees the broken down car as an opportunity. You see it as a problem. What is the difference? He is a mechanic. As a mechanic, he's confident that he can fix it. As a mechanic, he also knows that he's going to make money from it. So your frustration with the broken car has nothing to do with the broken car. Your frustration has to do with who you are. Every pain in your life has nothing to do with your environment. It has to do with who you are. Thank you, sir. Every struggle in your life has nothing to do with the environment. It has to do with who you are. Identity is where everything flows from. Identity is is where everything flows from. When Jesus was going to be crucified, as they came to arrest him, he looked at them, said, the son of darkness comes, he finds nothing in me. What identity has been formed in you as a boy? That's where I'm going with this. Do you have an orphan spirit? Prof, welcome, sir. Do you feel like an orphan? Do you feel like you are alone in this world? Because you had a father who never had time for you. Lots of men are struggling today because of absent fathers. Father who were, fathers who were not there to prize them. Fathers who were not there to enjoy them. Fathers who were not there to celebrate them. And then we've come into adulthood. Who we believe we are is a lonely, a lone person. Find it difficult to form relationships with other people. We find it difficult to submit to authority. We live independent lives. Because what has been logged into our nervous system is that no one is coming for you. As a, as a five-year-old boy, I was forgotten in school one day. It took 30 years for me to recover from the pain of that. Usually I would be picked up in school around 2 p.m. by a, 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 a family, a relative that lived with us. That morning, she had had a quarrel with my mom. And while my mom went to work and my dad went to work, both of them returned around 9 p.m. 
she also left the house. School closed at 2 p.m. There was nobody to pick me. My teacher stayed with me till about 3 p.m. Then she had to go. And then she dropped me with the security. And then 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m. And the fear that gripped me was no one is coming for me. No one is going to come for me. And I have never felt lonely and alone like that in my life. I was a five-year-old boy. But even as an adult, I struggled. No one is going to come for me. I have to make this work for myself. I have to make my life work for myself. I had an orphan spirit. And many men here today are still carrying an orphan spirit because of the abandonment of your path or your father. You grew up like a wild tree in the forest. No tendering. No nurturing. There was no one there to speak validation into your soul. The heavens opened. And the Bible says that God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son. Son, as you go into this temptation, you know that I prize you. God wants to speak affirmation into some man's heart today. You are not alone. In the struggles in your marriage, you are not alone. In the struggles financially, you are not alone. You have a father. You are not a bastard. You are not an orphan. The second gift God gave Jesus as he went into that warrior stage in his life was the gift of validation. Pay attention here. Around the age of 9 and 11, 12, every boy begins to ask a question. The question is, am I a man? Do I have what it takes? Can I stand in the committee of other men? Do I belong among the, 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 the table of men? We all did it. We gather around in the toilet and we look at each other's penises and we're looking at who has the, the longest one. And whoever wins that competition comes out of the bathroom feeling, yeah, I got it. I am the man. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, the rest of you are liars. God will forgive you. <laughs> and then we stand in front of the mirror and we're looking at the whiskers. The boy is 12. He's 11. And he's got, there's one whisker here. And he pulls it. It feels good. And he finds another one here. And some of us rob spirits. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, some of us rough spirits because we want those things to come out. Because when you come and you have a bird, then you are a man. But here it is. Every boy begins to ask that question, am I a man? Do I have what it takes? God's plan was that his father will be in his life calling forth his strength arranging challenges. And of course, the boy will be afraid, but daddy will be there saying, you can do it. You're my son. You've got what it takes. You can do it. And as he steps forward, and as he brings his strength, and he gets that thing done, daddy will be there saying, that's my boy, champion. And something begins to form in his heart that I can do stuff. I can undo my world. I can undo life. Is validated in his masculinity. But the tragedy for most of us is we never had fathers to do that for us. When we started asking the question, do I have what it takes? You see that we had no fathers there to confirm and validate us. Or we had fathers there who said, no, you are not a man. Stupid boy. There's nothing you know how to do. I heard that from my dad every day. There's nothing you know how to do. Maybe I, he asked me to do something. I didn't do it well. There's nothing you know how to do. I grew up as an adult boy, crippled in my initiative. Constant criticism. I knew at that time that I could not handle life. Write this down. Everything a man does, he does out of validation or for validation. Everything a man does. He either does it because he knows he's a man or he's doing it because he wants to feel like a man. I can preach because I need to know that I am a man. Or I can preach because I know that I am a man. Everything a man does, he does out of validation or for validation. Here is the problem. Around the age of 11, 12, when we begin to ask the question, am I a man? And there is no father there to call our strength and to affirm it. We take our questions elsewhere. Boys take to drinking. 
advertisers take advantage of that. They come to the table of men because you're drinking Gouda. No, the table of men is not Gouda drinking. But that's where most of us took our questions to. We started drinking. And if we can gulp down five bottles, then we feel like a man. Then we feel like a man. And that's why at the age of 50, we're still trying to impress other men with things we can consume, and that's what we think makes us men. And then we take it to women. If you can chase that girl and take her to bed, then you feel like a man. And then you see you have 70-year-old men that are taking their questions to the woman. If you go to Unilag, more me Hall tonight, you'll see their cars parked. They're coming to look for 18-year-old girls because in taking 18-year-old girls, they feel validated. Even though he's 70, he's trapped in the emotions of a 9-year-old. And he's still trying to find his masculinity, taking his question to a man, taking his question to women because daddy was not there to call forth his strength and to affirm him that he is a man. But the spirit of our father is in this place today. And your question about whether you are a man is going to be answered a big yes today. I say it's going to be answered a big yes today. God is going to validate you in the depths of your soul. In the name of Jesus. Everything a man does, he does for validation or out of validation. When a man goes to sleep with his wife, is it that he knows he's a man and he takes his strength to serve her? He comes into that marriage bed. He doesn't need to prove a point. He doesn't need to force himself on her. He knows he has what it takes to take her heart. He knows that if he takes her heart, he will take her body. He goes there confidently. And he uses his strength sexually to pleasure her. He doesn't go there to take her by force to prove that he is a man. That's a boy trapped in the body of a man. When we buy cars, when we achieve goals, we do it knowing that we are sons of God, that we are men already. We don't do it to prove to the world. That's why we have senators who are 60, 50 years old who are still trying to acquire toys to show that they are men. All over the world, you see unvalidated men causing so much pain. But God, tonight... And the rest of this conference is going to validate us. You will hear his voice saying, you are my beloved son. Hear ye him. When men have not validated, we cause a lot of trouble. We cause a lot of pain. We cause pain for God. We cause pain for our, le our spiritual leaders. Submission becomes difficult for us. Matthew chapter 17 verse 14. Let me show you this. Matthew chap John chapter 13 verse 3. Let me show you this. John 13 verse 3. Look at this as I close. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. He, know, he knew who he was. He rised from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and guarded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was guarded. Here is the Son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He takes a garment, he takes a towel, and is washing the feet of his disciples. He didn't feel that it was dishonoring. He didn't feel that it was beneath him. Because he knew he has come from God. And he was going to God. When you know who you are as a man, serving becomes a delight. Serving becomes a delight. Serving becomes a joy. You don't care whether you're on the stage or you're in the, in, the, in the parking lot. You don't care whether you're the one cleaning the house or it's your wife is doing it. Because you know who you are. When a man does not know who he is, he seeks everything to validate him. He preaches to impress. He, he makes love to impress. He dresses to impress rather than living out of an expression of a secured masculinity. 
As you sit there and there tonight, I know God has been speaking to your heart and been showing you the things that are out of place. How do we find strength and healing? I'll just take a minute and show you. Number one, you have to be honest with yourself. Ask yourself this. Where are you taking your question to? Where have you been taking your question to? That question, am I a man? Where have you been taking it to? Have you been taking it to alcohol? Have you been taking it to pornography? Do you know why men have a serious problem with pornography? Can I tell you this? A man who watches porn, the less a man feels, the more he watches porn. Why? As he's watching porn, that stored with a 10 minutes erection, he projects himself to be it. So he's the one with a big penis with a 10 minute erection that is pumping on that woman. He lives in that projection for 30 minutes. That's why it's such a big hook for men. Men who know who they are, they don't watch porn. Men watch porn to find validation. It's not just to jack off. It's not just to have a release. It is to feel manly. Because that guy that, you know, the, the, he brings milk to the door and this housewife sees him and she's shaking on her leg and he thinks he is the guy. So he lives in that false reality for five minutes. And that's why he's such a big hook. The more a man knows he's a man, the more he needs, he, the less he needs those things. Where are you taking your questions to? Your question, am I a man? Where have you been taking it to? Have you been taking it to pornography? Have you been taking it to having a string of girlfriends? Have you been taking it to aggression against your wife? I'm the man in this house. Where are you taking your question to? Where have you been trying to enforce your masculinity? Instead of living out of a reality of it. Masculine man is secure, he's serene. He knows he's strong. He can show forth strength. He can also show forth tenderness when it is required. It's the real deal. It begins with honesty. It begins with honesty. Second step is repentance. To say to God from today, I don't want to take my question to alcohol anymore. I don't want to take my questions to pornography anymore. I want to know real strength. I want to know real masculine strength. And to turn away from every place we've been going to find validation. Remember everything a man does, he does either for validation or out of validation. What we need to do is come to God and say, no, you are my father. You are the one that makes me a man. I will no longer go to pornography. I will no longer go to girlfriends. When we do that, we ask him to validate us. And there are many ways he does it. I don't have time to get into that. He brings other men into your life. A time in my life, I needed to know I was strong. I needed to know that I could do stuff. I needed to know that I had what it takes. I was struggling in business. I wasn't moving. I wasn't living out of validation. I was working for validation. I wanted to be seen and known. I was trying to do things. And God brought me, my life and brought me to Dominion City. And he used pastor to father me. And he's still using him to father me. I remember those days. I love those days. So we always talk about me. Pastor Lumide, Pastor Lumide, Pastor Lumide. And he was building strength inside of me. God will bring you, or bring you, or bring a man to you to father you. The question is, will you be able to receive the fathering? Will you have the wisdom, the discernment, to know that that which is missing in your life, God is trying to bring it into your life. Because the reason why we are bad men is that certain things that we're supposed to have, we didn't get it. Instructions for living. How many of you in this room ever sat down with your dad? Your dad ever sat you down and talked to you about women and sex? Can I see your hand? Look at it. In every congregation that I do it, always less than 2%. No wonder we struggle. 
How many of you in this room, your father ever, ever talked to you about, this is how you handle money. This is how you make it. This is how you save it. This is how you grow it. Can I see your hand? Maybe about 5%. In such a critical issue to a man's life about his finances, we live without instructions. We have grown up and become wild men who were not cultured. And God will bring a father into our lives to shape us, to build us, to put in us the things that we didn't get from our earthly father. The question is, will we be able to receive the fathering if you are going to be an authentic man you have to be able to say to God I'm ready to be fathered well pastor welcome sir I'm ready to be fathered and submit under the authority that God has put in our lives to father us and to shape us into true men and then from that place we can begin to live as men can we rise up tonight? I'm just going to spend two minutes just praying through those three steps. I want you to lift your hands and say to God, I need to be a real man. I want to be a real man. There's a part of me that is not validated. Open your mouth and begin to talk to him. There's a part of me that is not validated. There's a part of me that is broken. Then begin to bring repentance. I've been taking my question to alcohol. I've been taking my questions to women. It's not the time to look around, brother. I've been taking my question to women. I turn away from that. I walk away from that. I turn to you. You are my real father. You're my true father. I submit myself. To your plans and your purpose for my life. Open your mouth, brothers, and pray. I invite you. I open the door of my heart. I invite you to make me a man. Father, I come to you today. I'm going to pray for myself just to give you the language. I come to you today. There's, there, are, there are parts of me that has not, that's not settled into true masculinity, into authentic masculinity. And I've been taking my question to performance. I've been taking my question to, imp to impressing people. I've been taking my question to, 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 to being seen by women and having fame. I repent of that. I bring my question to you. Speak validation into my soul tonight. I want to be a man. part. Please play the next tape in the series.